Hi, this is Michael Altos. We are continuing our section on physiology of blood. This is recording part three. Let's talk in more detail about perioperative allergic reactions. These occur with an incidence of one in about 3,500 to 20,000, but with a mortality of about 4%, which is relatively high. 90% of them occur within five minutes of IV drug administration, although they can be delayed by as much as 20 minutes. The most common triggers of perioperative allergic reaction are our neuromuscular blocking agents, antibiotics, latex, and chlorhexidine. But the list of possible triggers is very long. It includes almost anything we administer, local anesthetics, induction agents, NSAIDs, protamine, colloid volume expanders, blood products, especially in patients who have IgA deficiency, bone cement, drug additives, insulin, mannitol, methyl methacrylate, radiocontrast dye, and vitamin K, just to name a few. Let's talk about some of these in detail. Many say that neuromuscular blocking agents are the most common trigger of perioperative allergic reaction. It's probably caused by IgE antibodies to the ammonium ions in these drugs. Interestingly, these ions are also found in household detergents, toothpaste, and cosmetics, and they may play a role in sensitizing patients. The most commonly uh, suspected drugs are rocuronium, succinylcholine, and atricurium. If a patient has a neuromuscular blocking agent allergy, we should consider that other agents may also lead to an allergic response, and even morphine has been shown in some studies to have cross-reactivity. These patients really need to be skin tested prior to anesthesia, if possible, so we know exactly what does and does not trigger their allergic reaction. As you can imagine, there are a lot of false reports and misinformation about what patients are actually allergic to, but this will uh, clearly have a big impact on how we practice anesthesia. We should also distinguish these reactions from non-immune histamine release. As we know, atricurium and mivacurium can cause histamine release from a non-immune mediated mechanism. Antibiotics like penicillins and sulfa drugs are known to cause allergic reactions. And we'll talk about that more in the section on antibiotics. Latex allergy is well known to occur in patients and healthcare workers. Anybody who has chronic exposure to latex, which includes healthcare workers, patients who have spina bifida, patients with urogenital abnormalities, and there seems to be a link with those who are allergic to bananas, avocado, kiwi, also patients who have atopic reactions. In fact, it's an occupational hazard. More than 15% of anesthesiologists had latex allergy, and that's probably more from back in the day when all gloves were latex. As you've probably seen, most of the non-sterile gloves that we wear are made of nitrile or some non-latex substance. Also, we believe that latex, is, since it's still worn in quite a lot of surgeons' sterile gloves, we think that as many as 15% of drug allergies that occur during anesthesia may actually not be anesthesia reactions, but a reaction to the latex gloves. Remember that not only rubber gloves, but medical devices like uh, Foley catheters and even latex caps for drug vials can be sources of latex exposure. And unlike the other allergic reactions in the OR, which are usually due to an IV drug and can occur within a few minutes, a latex allergy can have a delayed onset by up to 30 minutes. Local anesthetics we discussed previously. A true allergy to local anesthetics is relatively rare, and if it does occur, it's more likely to occur with esters than amides. We know that esters are metabolized to paraaminobenzoic acid, which is the allergen. There should not be cross-sensitivity between esters and amides, although preservatives can be a cause of allergic reaction, and they could be present in any drug. Methylparaben is a preservative that's metabolized into paraaminobenzoic acid. There are also sulfites, which are preservatives, and they can be allergens. In general, we should try to use preservative-free local anesthetics, but especially in patients with a history of allergic reaction to local anesthetics. Protamine, which we'll discuss in more detail in the coagulation section, can lead to allergy. There's some cross-reactivity between protamine and NPH insulin, where the P stands for protamine. Other patients at increased risk for protamine allergy are those with seafood allergy, 
and post-vasectomy patients. We should clarify that protamine can also cause direct histamine release, leading to profound hypotension. That's not an allergic reaction, but it's a side effect. And as we discussed briefly before, protamine may cause complement activation, and that may be the mechanism for the pulmonary hypertension. Allergy to opioids is quite rare, although we know that some, like morphine, can cause direct histamine release in a non-immune mediated mechanism. Allergy to propofol and barbiturates is also rather rare. When you suspect there is perioperative anaphylaxis, as we discussed, these have very fast onset and there is not much time to act. If you suspect it, the first thing to do is call for help, inform the surgeon and the rest of the perioperative team and bring the code cart because these patients can decompensate very quickly. We should look for possible causes that way we can limit their administration or stop them or take them away if possible. For example, latex gloves and Foley catheters. We should make sure the patient has a patent secured airway with 100% oxygen. So if they're intubated, you're in good shape. If they're not, you should consider whether intubation should be done. If inhalational agents are being used, they should be stopped until we make sure that the patient is hemodynamically stable. The same would be true for IV anesthetics as well. Once you've done these four basic things, the next step is uh, supporting the patient. The two things you need to do are epinephrine and volume. Epinephrine can be given in boluses of 10 to 100 micrograms IV. This helps restore that membrane permeability because we know the capillaries have become very leaky. It also helps to reverse bronchospasm. The alpha effect of epinephrine can increase blood pressure, while the beta effects lead to bronchodilation. You could give more epinephrine in a sub-Q or IM dose. Preferably, we do this if the reaction is not life-threatening, because it does take a slightly longer amount of time for sub-Q and IM dosing to work. But we know that an adult EpiPen can be used to save people's lives. That has 300 micrograms, and it's given IM. An advantage of giving it IM or, I, or sub-Q instead of IV is that you might get a longer duration of effect and less of that initial spike in blood pressure and heart rate with IV injection. You could also run an infusion of epinephrine. Usually I would start between 0.05 and 0.1 micrograms per kilogram per minute and then titrate. Patients who are having anaphylaxis may need literally liters of fluid infused. Remember we said they could lose up to half their intravascular volume into the interstitial space. And there aren't good studies that show a preference over crystalloid versus colloid. So either one is fine to resuscitate these patients. After covering the first steps in management of perioperative anaphylaxis, we can now touch on some other common therapies. One therapy is antihistamines, specifically diphenhydramine, 0.5 to 1 milligrams per kilogram, also known as Benadryl. This is a histamine antagonist and may prevent the side effects from the significant histamine release that occurs during anaphylaxis. Ideally, it should be given slowly in order to prevent any of the antidopaminergic hypotension that may occur. This won't help if the problem is due to other vasoactive substances like leukotrienes and especially the negative inotropy and bronchospasm that uh, leukotrienes may cause. There are also people who give H2 blockers. The indications for this are unclear, and the feeling is probably that it doesn't hurt, but you wouldn't want to delay more important therapies um, in order to give H2 blockers earlier. Other drugs that are commonly given would be bronchodilators, beta-2 agonists, in order to help treat bronchospasm. What is the role of corticosteroids? Classically, people have always been taught to give glucocorticoids in the treatment of anaphylaxis. Current guidelines do not show that there is any evidence to support using corticosteroids in the treatment of anaphylaxis. The exception would be perhaps with patients who have very severe bronchospasm or asthmatic patients who are at risk for severe bronchospasm. We know that corticosteroids will have no immediate effect. It will take 
at least four to six hours for those steroids to have a clinical effect. Uh, but they may enhance the activity of beta agonist drugs that you've given, like albuterol, and they may help prevent the biphasic or protracted reaction that can occur in some patients, again, especially patients with severe respiratory symptoms. If corticosteroids are used, the dose commonly cited is 1 to 2 grams of methylprednisolone. Finally, remember that we can support the patient in other ways. Sodium bicarbonate may be necessary for severe acidosis, 0.5 to 1 milliequivalent per kilogram, and other vasopressors like norepinephrine or vasopressin may be useful to support blood pressure in patients with persistent hypotension. Again, early clinical diagnosis is required for acute treatment. So we need to make our best guess and go forward with supportive care as soon as we think there's an allergic reaction. You can send labs to confirm diagnosis, but that's not going to help you today. We would never wait for labs to come back in order to declare an allergic reaction. But it may be helpful for future anesthetics. So we can send a plasma histamine level. About 10 minutes after the allergic reaction, plasma histamine levels are detectable. Usually within about 30 minutes after onset of the event is when we want to draw a plasma level. It's usually drawn in a lavender or a citrate tube. And then we can also check tryptase, which peaks usually at about 60 to 90 minutes and may persist for several hours. Usually drawn in a red top or a lavender or a heparin or a citrate tube. These would be sent off to the lab and checked subsequently to help us um, verify that what we were treating was actually an anaphylactic reaction and not some other drug reaction or other hypotensive event. Then patients may go to an allergist for skin testing um, or other testing in order to confirm the specific identity of the thing that precipitated the allergic reaction. That's it for this section. Please let me know if you have questions about any of the material.